I want to um, offer a few caveats before I begin my talk. Firstly, um, I'm a media scholar, so um, being in a department of political and social science is a valuable experience for me, but I am speaking from a different disciplinary perspective. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about representational practices in feminist theory, policy and practice. So today I'm not going to be pointing the finger at the media, but rather trying to think about how our own, specifically my own, representational practices construct and limit understandings of the interrelationships of gender and violence. And the talk that I'm giving today is based on this paper, which has just been published in the journal Feminist Theory. Um, and if you don't have access to the journal, you can access a free pre-publication version on the Strathclyde website. Um, Femicide is part of what I'll talk about, but within the broader context of feminist theorisations of the interrelationships of gender and violence. And my framework here is feminist theory published in English, so I'm excited to learn from you whether these observations pertain in the Italian context. And one final caveat is that this was originally written before um, Weinstein and Me Too happened. Um, and that's what I'm working on currently. I'm working on a book called Me Too, Weinstein and Feminist Theory. And given the significance of that case for the issues I want to discuss, I will try and refer to that case if there's time, but hopefully we can maybe pick up on it in discussion. Okay, so the origins of this paper are a mistake, my mistake. Um, so a few years ago, I was invited to speak at the London School of Economics Gender Commission and I was invited to speak about representations of sexual violence. I agreed this a few months ahead of the deadline, and then as the deadline approached, they said, we need an abstract from you, we need a title. And I rather hurriedly put together an abstract. And to my horror, when I went to write the paper, I discovered I'd promised a paper on representing gender-based violence. Now, I'd been invited to talk about sexual violence, I'd intended to talk about men's sexual violence against women, but yet I'd fallen into using this quite bureaucratic language that I think you've already alluded to, Rashida, in terms of this language of keeping that seems to keep gender at the front, but actually does so in a very gender-neutral way. Um, and in this case, it was completely inappropriate to what I wanted to talk about, which was to scope and distorted and disguised the realities of who is doing what to whom. So what I actually wanted to talk about was representing men's sexual violence against women. And this mistake really got me to thinking about how and why we use particular categories in feminist thinking. And feminist naming practices are essentially about the connections we want to take, we want to make between different forms of violence. And Rashida's already talked about this in terms of the continuum. And that's been central to the work that I've been doing. And I've used this term, continuum thinking, which I think characterises much feminist theory on the relationships of gender and violence. And the continuum comes from Liz Kelly's work and the continuum on women's, of women's experiences of sexual violence. In a book published in 1988, she talks about women's experiences that have a basic common character. It's not a hierarchical or a limit, linear model. And actually, I think Me Too has been a very interesting campaign for thinking about the continuum of men's sexual violence against women, because it's provided many different examples, um, really spanning a whole spectrum of, of actions and behaviours but it's also spawned a number of challenges. Accusations that feminists can't tell the difference between a hand on a knee and rape, for instance. That was a particular case that was referred to in the UK press. And this spectacularly misses the point. Those actions, the hand on a knee in a professional context and rape, are linked because they're sexualized displays of power which inflect women's engagements with the public sphere, not because the actions are equivalent and not because they're both necessarily criminal. So continuum thinking then characterises 
doesn't always hinge on women's experiences, although the examples, um, although that's where it comes from in Liz Kelly's writing. And there are different ways of grouping the field, if you like. Whether we're thinking about victims or survivors, so centering women's experiences, we'd use the term violence against women. If we're thinking about perpetrators, talking about men's violence. And we really need to be thinking about continuums in the plural so that we centre connections but are clear that we're not trying to claim equivalence between behaviours and actions that are very different. So what I want to try and do in the rest of my time with you today um, is just give you four examples of this um, and the paper talks about some other examples as well and, and does so in more detail. <coughs> So I want to talk about the relationship between gender-based violence and violence against women. I want to try and think about the continuum across a life course, so looking at the relationship between adult and child experiences. Partly because my own background is in media, I want to talk about symbolic and material violence, so thinking about the role of representation. And then finally I want to come on to thinking about <coughs> men's behaviour. So let's start then with gender-based violence, which, as I said earlier, is about trying to think about continuities in meaning and context. And this definition, which I'm sure will be familiar to many of you, is a common definition used um, in EU and many international contexts. And here, the basic common character underlying women's experiences of abuse is not always a male perpetrator, but rather that women are targeted because they are women. So we see here, violence against women is a form of gender-based violence that affects women excessively, as it's directly connected with the unequal distribution of power between women and men, which perpetuates the devaluation and subordination of women and violates women's fundamental rights and freedoms. Now here, violence against women is presented as a subset of gender-based violence. And they're not strictly synonymous, although one of my concerns is that they're often treated as such in practice, and using the term gender-based violence, and I think you alluded to this too, has sometimes become a way of not talking about women and women's experiences. And I've put up here in the slide, um, just because I always like to give a shout out to one of my favourite feminist blogs, um, Deborah Cameron's Language of Feminist Guide blog, which if you're interested in language in English, is really excellent on these issues. And she has a couple of blogs which specifically talk about the language of violence. And one of the things she claims is that gender-based violence suggests a very bureaucratic register. Um, and it is a, is a register that states can get on board with in a way that the gender-specific language of violence against women sometimes isn't. So my question then is what do we gain from thinking about violence against women as gender-based violence? Violence against women is an umbrella concept which centres the experiences of women as victims or survivors of violence, but gender-based violence is an umbrella concept which focuses on the meaning of violence rather than the identities of victims or perpetrators. Now sometimes one or both of these terms is the appropriate term to use. What I'm not doing here is saying this is a language we shouldn't use at all. I want us to think about the implications of when we use that language. So I just want to pick up an example here um, which is to do with femicide specifically. Um, and picks up on, on some of the themes we've heard about already. So femicide, I think, is a term that does both these things, that actually allows us to talk about gender-based violence against women um, in the same way as you were talking there about gender-related killings of women. The word gender there isn't a substitute for being specific about women, but it helps us understand why this, this abuse is happening, the context in which it's happening. Now, the term femicide allows us to think about who the victim is and why they've been targeted, and allows us to place that violence in the continuum of men's violence against women, noting, for instance, that women, unlike men, are at least as likely to be murdered by an intimate partner or family member as by a stranger, so that there's something very specific about the killing of women. But the term femicide doesn't presuppose 
a male perpetrator. <laughs> so honour killing, for example, is one form of femicide which has involved and does involve female perpetrators, although in relatively small numbers. And in a UK context, Asha Gillick has argued that placing so-called honour-based violence on the continuum of gender-based violence against women allows us to see continuities across cultures, and again, we've heard some of that already, challenging the notion that cultural values provide a unique justification for these crimes. And this, I think, is particularly significant when the communities that perpetuate honour-based violence are ethnic minorities within a dominant cultural context such as South Asian communities in the UK. Here, the gender-based violence against women continuum becomes a powerful tool in resisting the othering of these communities. Instead, understanding the connections between violence against women in the name of honour, and as we've heard, violence against women in the name of passion, for instance, um, or other forms of non-lethal domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. Okay, but expanding the continuum in this way means including acts which involve female perpetrators. But if we take the question of who is targeted, the continuum extends generationally. So we have to consider the lives of girls as well as adult women. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit now. In terms of understanding the continuum in one woman's life, we're thinking about the continuum as a life cycle of victimisation, sexualisation and gendered inequality. And in that context, feminists have long argued for the importance of understanding the relationships between violence against girls and violence against women. However, feminists have not just linked girl and woman abuse, but child and woman abuse. And indeed, that's the name of the unit that Liz Kelly heads up at London Metropolitan University. So why? What's the connection between child abuse and women abuse? Well, first of all, we might think about um, coexistence. And the most obvious context for coexistence is domestic abuse. However, where the abuse of women and children of all genders overlap in this <coughs> way, the abuse of children also needs to be understood as gender-based. So the children are targeted because of their significance within household gender dynamics. But not all violence against children is gender based. Violence against women and children as a term suggests a continuum that is based on an understanding of vulnerability rather than a continuum of meaning. And if I can just give you one example from my own local context in Scotland, Last year, our government published a consultation on the draft delivery plan for Equally Safe. Equally Safe is Scotland's strategy to prevent and eradicate violence against women and girls, and there's many, many good things in it. But despite the emphasis on a gendered analysis of violence against women and girls in the original strategy, the draft delivery plan, and you can see in my quote on the slide there, explicitly includes children of all genders as subject to harm through violence and aims to improve the lives and experiences of all children affected by violence. Now this I think is a really clear example of where the parallels between women and children seem to be being drawn on the basis of an assumed shared vulnerability and we're losing the gender-based analysis of how and why women and children are targeted by men in domestic and other contexts. And I hope it goes without saying in this audience that ending violence against all children is essential work. That's not in doubt. But my concern here is the implications of semantically <coughs> linking women and children in this way, particularly in a policy context where resources are scarce and where expertise is then brought into the panel that is not about taking um, a gender-based analysis. Okay, so although for feminist work, um, the continuum of vulnerability is not how feminists have typically approached the relationship between child abuse and women abuse, that is a critique that is sometimes levelled against feminists, that we see women and children as always and only victims. <coughs> 
And I want to move on to my third point now, which is to think of some of the complexities of this in relation to prostitution and pornography. Um, okay, as children cannot consent to sex, they cannot consent to involvement in prostitution and pornography. And there's been a really important shift in our language around this issue over the last five to 10 years. For instance, although by no means in all cases, throwing out the language of the child sex worker or child prostitute to insist that what we are talking about is a child abused in prostitution. And likewise, the term child pornography has been challenged by an emphasis on child abuse images, trying to name what it is that's going on here. But I do have a concern that an exclusive emphasis on the sexual in relation to prostitution and pornography results in the marginalisation of the abuse of adult women. Because adult women can legally consent, unlike children, whether or not they do consent seems to be less central to these debates than it should be. And what happens when children abused in pornography become adults and choose to in pornography or work in prostitution? Does the harm magically cease the day they turn 16? As with work on honour-based violence, using continuum thinking here opens up separate but interlocking continuums. A continuum of choice and coercion, which centres the sexual, and a continuum of sexual violence. And I think this lets us unseat the binary distinction between child and adult woman without collapsing these experiences into one. And so this to me is the real advantage of continuum thinking. It's about trying to identify the way in which things are related without saying they're the same. And I think that's one of the popular misconceptions about feminism, that we're flattening these distinctions. And I think it's important to hang on to them. But I want to now um, pick up on pornography in a slightly different context, which is to think about pornography as representation and the challenges that poses for continuum thinking. So at least in its audiovisual manifestations, pornography <laughs> is both a material practice, so we see real bodies doing real things, and a form of representation. So those bodies um, perform in ways that are scripted, their pleasure is often faked, and so on. Now, debates about whether pornography is violence against women are very contentious within feminism. But continuum thinking, I think, helps us out of this impasse. Recent strategies to make the abuses of pornography visible have included a challenge to the conceptual utility of the term itself. And I'm going to talk here specifically about the idea of revenge porn, a term which has increasingly become a media stand-in for the non-consensual creation or sharing of sexual images. And as with critiques of child pornography, defining these practices as pornography has been argued by some critics to downplay their seriousness as acts of abuse with perpetrators and real life consequences, assuming that the term pornography is, is a synonym for sex effectively. So Claire McGlynn and her <coughs> colleagues at the University of Durham have proposed the term image-based abuse in its stead. And when, in their article where they discuss image-based abuse, they use Kelly's notion of the continuum in two ways. Firstly, um, they describe. I'm just going to put them all up here so I remember. Firstly, they describe um, the continuum um, of image-based abuse to get beyond revenge porn as a term itself and establish similarities with other forms of image-based abuse. By focusing on women's experiences, they're able to understand connections between practices which are otherwise very different. Some of which involve fakery others non-consensual production or distribu distribution, but all cause material harm. So they're thinking about the links between things like sexualized photoshopping um, and the distribution of pornographic images without consent. But more broadly than this, their second use of the continuum is to theorize image-based abuse as part of Kelly's longer continuum of women's experiences of men's sexual violence. And this is important in establishing the ways in which apparently new forms of sexual violence 
are conceptually and experientially similar to more well-documented patterns of abuse. And I was thinking about this again yesterday, I don't know if any of you saw, but Amnesty International released a report yesterday um, called Hashtag Toxic Twitter. And many of those arguments there about the abuse of women on the social media platform, I think echo this context where we need to understand the, specificity, the specificities of that abuse, but we also need to understand the way in which it's linked to much longer standing patterns of abuse. Um, but I think it's important here not to conflate material um, and representational practice. So I'll just give a very quick example of this, um, and I'll come back to this question at the bottom here in a minute. The abusive production practices of much audiovisual pornography are appropriately positioned on a continuum of sexual violence that, to take a mainstream example, doesn't make sense for something like the phenomenon that is Fifty Shades of Grey. It's a novel. No one was, as far as we know, abused in the writing of the novel. On the other hand, the novel and hardcore <coughs> audiovisual pornography may exist on another continuum, a continuum of representations of sexual violence. And to deploy another concept from Kelly, um, the representational continuum provides a conducive context for additional material acts of sexual violence, legitimating and supporting a culture of male sexual entitlement, dominance, and coercive control. And I think that word impunity that we heard earlier is really a key part of this, of this discussion. The Weinstein case and those that have followed on from it have demonstrated that a distinction between the abusive production practices of pornography and the mainstream is not entirely clear cut. The sex may be faked, but that doesn't mean the production context is devoid of coercion. And some of the things I want to think about here are the critical commercial and cultural value of abuse for the film industry. So how many times abuse is actually in plain sight, but is not seen as abuse because it's something else. It's a sign of male creative genius, do you know? Um, at the same time, I think there's important questions to be asked about the requirement on actresses to produce themselves to be looked at, not just on screen, but also in public events. And although I won't really have time to talk about it here, one of the things that's quite interesting about the Weinstein case is the way he's tried to use images like the one on the slide here um, of him with Ashley Judd to say abuse couldn't possibly have happened because look, here we are you know, many months or years later. So I think there's a lot that we can begin to unpack here. And just in drawing to an end, I want to consider some of the implications of a reorientation to more explicitly centre men's behaviours. So this is the last thing I want to talk about. One of the key contributions of continuum thinking has been to establish the ways in which typical and aberrant male behaviour shade into one another. And my allusion there to the abusive male genius um, would, would be part and parcel of this. So a continuum of sexual violence from catcalling to sexual murder is about seeing continuities, not equivalencies, between men's everyday normalised and accepted practices and criminal, clearly aberrant behaviour. And as such, much of this work has been centrally about what Raymond Colin Connell calls hegemonic masculinity. The continuum of men's violences allows us to think of violence as being gender-based, not because of who it targets, but rather how that violence is understood in relation to perpetrators' gender performances. And this can allow us to make gendered sense of behaviours which don't seem to fit comfortably on the continuums that we've explored so far. So some of the kind of names and categories um, that I've put up there. Weinstein, as we know, has been accused of a range of offences, including rape, all against adult women. Spacey, on the other hand, is the most high profile figure who's been accused of offences against young men. <coughs> So to go back to my original terms, violence against women doesn't encapsulate all of what's going on in those two cases. And my other two examples of spree shooters and terrorism are similar in that respect. The vast majority of spree shootings, particularly in the US, 
and the vast majority of terrorist offences are committed by men. But they don't um, often, although they do sometimes, target their victims in gendered terms. So the first thing all of these things have in common is that there's overwhelmingly male perpetrators. And is there any advantage in using continual thinking in this way? Writing in The Guardian, Hadley Freeman suggests a correlation between terrorist acts of violence um, and te the men involved, violence against more women, um, prior to their more spectacular violence. And she, does, she sees this uh, relationship primarily in relation to the embrace of fundamentalist patriarchal belief systems. And is it pains to point out that that can be in pretty much any major religion. And these belief systems advocate wildly restrictive attitudes towards gender. So she points to the ways in which, in men's experiences, different forms of violence can serve similar purposes as expressions of patriarchal belief systems. Similarly, in a study of men who murder their intimate partners, Dobash and Dobash note evidence about the actions and orientations of violent abusers and intimate partner murderers parallel reports of men who use violence in other contexts, including violence against other men. So in this respect, I think there's clear advantages to thinking about <laughs> some men's violence against other men, at least in some circumstances, as gender-based. And that's something we miss if we treat gender-based violence and violence against women as synonymous. But two important caveats, and then oops, I'll stop. Um, this isn't a biological argument. In arguing that this is gender-based violence to the extent that it's perpetrated by men because they are men, I'm referring to the ways they relate to and embody normative constructions of gender roles. These actions make sense for men in a way they rarely do for women. It's a constructionist, not an essentialist argument. Secondly, while this model may provide a useful lens through which to consider abusive men's behaviour, it doesn't necessarily help us understand men's experiences <coughs> of victimisation. Men are not necessarily targeted because they are men, nor is their experience of victimisation consistent with gender inequality. Now, there are important exceptions to this. For instance, the explicit targeting of men who are, or seem to be, gay or trans, where they're attacked because of their perceived transgressions of dominant gender norms. But insisting that gender isn't a synonym for women, and gender-based violence is not synonymous with violence against women, is not to argue that we simply add men to existing models and stir. Rather, it's to highlight the conceptual limitations of the ways we currently frame gender-based violence and argue that the interrelationships between gender and violence are more multifaceted than some models suggest. So to draw to a conclusion then, um, what I'm really hoping this work helps do is encourage us to reflect upon the ways in which violence is and is not understood through a gendered lens. And although I work mainly on the media, I'm starting with feminist theory here because feminist theory is the tool that I use to understand the media. And I think that's where feminist media studies or literary and linguistic studies can bring something to the table by thinking critically about the ways in which the theories are themselves representational practices and policies for that matter, which name, include and exclude. The notion of the continuum is rightly influential, but I think we do need to think about it in the plural and be alert to the ways in which we seek to establish connections and try to ensure that our language accurately reflects our focus and doesn't disguise or distort as my own mistake did that started me on this exploration.